I'm very pleased to uh, uh, welcome Jeffrey Scholar, who is uh, one of many partners in crime in putting this gathering together, and he will be moderating the symposium. Jeffrey, as you know from uh, your program, is a uh, professor in the Department of Film and Media. He's also an ARC affiliate. He is um, uh, a, a, a groundbreaking author as a film critic and also himself a distinguished um, uh, maker of film and video, especially in um, experimental documentary. So Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and I wanted to th thank Shannon for giving me the opportunity to put together this panel, uh, particularly in relation to my own history uh, uh, as an experimental uh, filmmaker and part of the uh, international avant-garde film movement, um, uh, which is in very uh, alive and active, but very much in transformation. And uh, we're here in what was once the um, uh, film theater of the Berkeley Art Museum. The PFA has now moved to a, a different theater across Bancroft. Uh, but I spent many hours watching uh, single screen films here uh, uh, in ecstasy. And it's wonderful that the space is being used now for uh, a kind of uh, intermedial and multidisciplinary uh, 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 time-based art, uh, at, at least uh, to talk about those uh, issues. Uh, I just thought we would start because I, I want to show uh, a film, and uh, I wanted to uh, pay homage to one of the great uh, American filmmakers uh, who passed away this fall, uh, George Kuchar, and I think that George uh, embodied many of the kind of uh, uh, the spirit of mixing uh, different art forms, film, video, performance, painting, uh, and um, this, uh, this is a short film of his uh, called uh, I, an Actress, and in many ways it embodies um, a, a lot of the things that we're talking about uh, today. So uh, I'm going to see if I can get this up. It's wonderful. Get a tight shot of her face. 
all right? <laughs> you got to tie that up. You wake up at 3 in the morning. Yeah, see what it's like. Oh, sweat, stains on the sheet. What happened to us? Uh, Harry, you have to the body. All right, now. All right, now. Get it. How tight is your shot? I'm going to get it. It's not for My hand is it. Is the microphone in? Is it going to work? Okay. All right, now, Barbara, with this, when I cheat, it's not for sex. It's not for sex. All right? All right, now it's turn it. This is sort of close up on it. All right, go ahead. When I cheat, it's not for sex. All right, now turn it. Face the wall. Good. All right. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All right, now when you do, go back a bit. Go back. All so you can wake up and sleep in the morning with a cold or sweat. It's the way you feel like you're doing to me. All right? So you can wake up in the morning with a cold or sweat. It's the way you feel like you're doing to me. So you can wake up in the morning with a cold or sweat. You want to sweat and stay in the streets? Yeah, do this. Hey, we can do that. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Or is it just a thrill of old with her hands with the rest of the line? Uh, or is it just a thrill of old with her hands touching your naked muscle flesh? Or is it just a thrill of old with her hands touching your naked muscle flesh? Or is it just a thrill of old with her hands touching your naked muscle flesh? Or is it just a thrill of old with her hands touching your naked muscle flesh? Or is it just a thrill of old with her hands touching your naked muscle flesh? Or is it just a thrill of old with her hands touching your naked muscle flesh? Or is it just a thrill of old with her hands touching your naked muscle flesh? All right, okay. A villa is better than hell overlooking the small. Okay. Now, look at the red in your mouth. Is that what you want, Harold? Now, look at the red in your mouth. Is that what you want, Harold? Or is it just touching your naked muscle flesh? Touching your naked muscle flesh. Flesh the eyes. All right, naked flesh. I hate it when you say that. Don't look like I need you so much. Don't look like I need you so much. Flesh your food. Flesh. Body. Flesh that I body. That I bruise with my kiss. seeing a woman on her knees, and then you do it, or are you used to them on their backs? All right, do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So George, George was just the kind of uh, underground uh, uh, media artist that w where he fit, did he fit into uh, 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 mainstream cinema, did he fit into the art world, Is, uh, uh, he made all kinds of, different kinds of work in film and video and, and so he's exactly the kind of uh, question mark that uh, I hope um, some of the um, uh, discussions we have can um, address in some ways. Uh, film, since its beginnings, has, has, as you can see, has been uh, the bastard child of the art world, at once a medium of fascination for artists. Uh, nearly every major artist of the 20th century flirted with making or referencing films. Yet, for the most part, the cinematic work, their cinematic works have been seen as a minor sideshow in their bodies of works. I think of Leger or Cornell or Richard Serra, just to name three. And, and finally, in 2012, the first major study of Andy Warhol's films by a major art historian has uh, been, finally been published with Douglas Crimp's uh, book, Our Kind of Movie, The Films of Andy Warhol. So those are just examples of, of, of some of the ways in which uh, a film uh, has been marginal within the art world. Much of this is connected to the historical ambivalence around film as high culture uh, worthy of uh, the museum. Uh, there's also the problem of its commodifiability and the way arts, the arts are taught, studied, historicized within the academy, uh, both within art history and film studies departments. Uh, the film and, uh, and film and video uh, has also been divided off departmentally in museums, which until recently, uh, f film and media programs have been afterthoughts to the main curatorial projects of museums. <laughs> Avant-garde film uh, and video artists, many of whom have made works that have profoundly influenced the course of contemporary art and cinema, have lived and died paupers and virtually unrecognized by either uh, the art or the film world. Uh, preservation and accessibility of their works are often uh, in question since these roles of celluloid and videotapes have little value as art commodities. Uh, Canyon Cinema, uh, one of the oldest artist-run uh, film distribution uh, uh, companies here in San Francisco, um, and one of the most important depositories and distributors of post-war film art uh, is currently sliding into oblivion as film technologies give way to the digital. And there's little financial incentive to save this work in any kind of sustainable way. And since there's no economic reason to save it, much of it will just disappear. And uh, George's work uh, uh, is really a very much a part of that uh, legacy. So this issue of what happens to nonprofit uh, media centers uh, uh, and uh, how they've been defunded is something that uh, we we can talk about. The problem of context for time-based media is also a complex question. In what ways is the museum and gallery an appropriate place to deal with the complex te temporalities of moving images in time? 
This is not only a question of technologies, but one of film form and language. Can the kind of complex narrative development and intellectual and experiential attention so central to time-based media be had as people wander through museum exhibit halls and filmmakers adapt their work to the social and physical constraints of the museum and gallery? So another issue is the whole question of space and environment uh, 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 as the uh, practices begin to change. There's also the problem of academic training that art historians and curators receive in universities in which art history departments require little training in film history and especially in the history of artists made films. This has partly been the fault of academic disciplinarity where f film studies grew out of language and literary studies rather than art history or visual studies. But the question remains how one, how can one deeply understand 20th century or 21st century art uh, without having a deep knowledge of film history and theory? For many of us who have been in the experimental film and video world for a long time, we've watched the wheel be reinvented over and over as newer media uh, work enters the museums and critical discourses in the art world, constantly returning to the concerns and practices of earlier work without the his historical and critical knowledge uh, of that earlier work to give it context. So these are some of the questions that sort of arose for me uh, in putting this together. But happily, this is starting to change, I think, as there's a greater understanding of th these histories. New technologies have opened on to these histories, often making them reappear through new artists' interests in their own historical legacies. And younger art historians have had to turn to film history as they discover the prehistories of the artists they're discovering. Finally, there's also the changing, um, um, in, in looking at the changing role of film and video in the art world, we, we have to look seriously at the problem of its commodifiability and how that is situating the work. Uh, though it took most of the 20th century to do it, I'm rem I was reminded of how the art world has finally been able to turn cinematic works into commodifiable objects. Several years ago, I uh, wanted to uh, write about uh, Shirin Nishat's uh, uh, single, uh, short single installation pieces. Uh, and I went to the Gladstone Gallery in New York to ask if I could borrow a DVD so that I could study it to, uh, to write about it. And they looked at me like I was crazy. Are you kidding? These DVDs are worth $150,000 each, and we don't give them out. A few years later, Sharin has released last year or the year before her first feature film, Women Without Men, which uh, contain reworkings of those very same uh, 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 shots, and you can buy it now on Amazon for $18. Uh, so um, I, it made me want to uh, uh, write something called uh, the, the Work of Art, the Work of uh, the Work the work of commodification in the age of mechanical reproduction. So that whole question about funding and how this kind of work gets reproduced and funded and uh, exhibited in the context of for-profit uh, uh, culture becomes another question we, uh, we can talk about. Uh, and so I invited a distinguished panel of media artists uh, uh, a film scholar and a video curator to talk about this transforming history and the ways in which their own practices have transformed over the years and how we're learning to speak, see, and feel in time across the boundaries of these histories and institutions. So I I'm going to first invite uh, uh, Jean C. C. Finley uh, to uh, present. Uh, Jean is a media artist who works in experimental and documentary forms, including including film, video, photography, installation, internet, and site-specific public works. 
Her work has been exhibited in international institutions, including the Guggenheim uh, Museum, the San Francisco and New York Museums of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum, and the Georges Pompidou Center. She's been the recipient of numerous grants, including the Rockefeller Guggenheim and Creative Capital grants. Uh, and uh, her work has been shown uh, uh, internationally, uh, including on uh, radio TV Belgrade in Yugoslavia. Um, in 1994, she was an artist in residence in Istanbul, Turkey, and, uh, and her tapes have won awards at international festivals such as San Francisco, Atlanta, Berlin Video, the Berlin Video Festival, Toronto, and w the Worldwide Video Festival. So I'd like to bring uh, Jean up, and then I'll introduce the other panelists as they go. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. It's really, really a pleasure and an honor. Uh, so it's it's always really difficult to follow George Kuchar, um, <laughs> um, but you know he was a dear friend and um, and someone I think who's inspired so many people. So I'm also very honored to to follow him. Uh, Jeffrey asked me to consider how the relationship between time-based artists and their exhibition spaces have shifted during my 20 plus years of making work. And because my work is representational in nature and frequently uses documentary strategies, I want to look at the question from that perspective. And I'd also like to look at the question not only from the perspective as an artist, but as an as a educator. Um, because I've uh, understood that the, the time-based programs at CCA, where I teach, um, have really involved in parallel to the institutions that exhibit the work of, of the students there. And I, at the foundation of the evolution, I think, are really the significant technological changes that have occurred um, with time-based media over the last 30 years. For artists working with representational media, these uh, changes have really shaped the nature of the inquiry around ethics and engagement and changed the relationship between the artists and the institutions that exhibit them. Shifts in technology, I think, have historically really changed the human relationship to time itself. And since this panel is about time, I want to kind of address that for a minute. Um, the way time is understood and quantified um, has determined cultural production, I think, in all aspects of our society. And as our ability to measure time has become more precise and the expectation to have those measurements available to us at all times um, becomes a, a part of our general identity, um, many people share the notion that the world has sped up. And I think hand in hand with that nature of a sped up world is the idea of a world that has shrunk. So this relationship of time and space, I think, is is really a big part of, of my work and a lot of artists who work with, with time-based media. Um, uh, and artists working with, with time-based technology and the offshoots of that technology, like GPS devices and social media sites, are by the very ne nature of those mediums grappling with the cultural shifts of that perception of time. And this changing notion of our world's time frame, when combined with the ubiquitous ability to um, represent the world around us through our constant access to uh, recording and representational media, places artists working with the media really, I think, at the center of conversations of the conceptual and socially engaged art and the inherent power dynamics there. Um, I'm just, we have a slightly skewed aspect ratio with these pictures, and I'm just throwing up some images, and I'm, if I have time, I'll show two pieces. If not, I'll just show one piece at the end, but these are just some visual references. So during the last 30 years, um, educational and exhibiting institutions, ha I think, have tended to define themselves less frequently as reflections and repositories of culture, and more frequently as institutions that actually produce culture itself. I know that CCA recently rewrote its mission statement, and it begins, CCA educates students to shape and make culture. And this shift away from the way artists working with time-based media, it really shifts the way we both learn and exhibit um, our craft. 
Artists began working with video primarily within a conceptual practice, and the low-res, raw quality of video fit really well into the idea of the anti-aesthetic that was talked about last night in the keynote address. And it was really an ideal forum, uh, and I, I'm not really using the word medium there, it was really an ideal forum for created work that posited an alternative to the dominant structures of the art world, gender politics, Hollywood, television, and traditional authoritative documentary filmmaking. And as a means to both critique um, the established social structures and as a way to see within and seeing new ways of seeing those structures. Um, Video was not so much a medium as it was a vehicle, I think, to explore conceptually um, these socially engaged questions. And the video work that was being made didn't really have a place in traditional art venues, so artists started these nonprofit spaces that Jeffrey referred to to champion and show the work. And then organizations like Paper Tiger Television emerged and created work specifically for cable television, invited artists to come in and make work for c cable television, which was, you know, at the time, just a, a really, really ins exciting venue for artists. And in San Francisco, you could always see something that was called video art, whether as performance or installation or as a screening. And um, video art became named as such, and a lot of artists, myself included, defined themselves and identified themselves as video artists. Um, come on. Um, as video technology developed and high quality image resolution became available at a lower and lower price, more artists began to integrate documentary production into their work. And in the 90s, a really strong relationship between artists dealing with social issues and time-based media developed out of that intersection. Um, and a craft began to develop around the idea of the video medium in conjunction with its conceptual use. It was interesting to remember as I, as I thought about this that how many local PBS stations showed the work of artists at the time. Um, uh, there were programs like the 90s, it was based in Colorado. Um, artists like myself had uh, work broadcast regularly at P on PBS and I, I still have a whole bookshelf full of VHS tapes that I recorded off of television of artists' work that I show in my classes all the time. Um, and these hybrid documentary forms began to find their way more frequently from the alternative spaces into the museums. And I think that uh, uh, the, the infamous 1993 Whitney Biennial, where I, I also had a piece in that biennial as well, really was sort of the, the moment where that, where that happened. And um, I appreciated Daniel's uh, comments about that, that moment in, in the, this history. Um, but the advent of digital technology and laptop editing um, is perhaps the most significant technological development in the artist's relationship to time-based media. Whereas before the ability to record and to construct and to edit and exhibit time-based work um, really was only available to those people who went far out of their way to get that access. It wasn't easy. I mean, I spent, you know, I would edit at the Bay Area Video Co Coalition from one in the morning to five in the morning. Uh, um, you, it, was, it was hard to get access. Um, but with universal access, which is what we have now with, with the whole digital revolution, the compartmentalizing of video art as a distinct practice with distinct exhibition venues um, has really dissolved into an interdisciplinary practice for most artists. And many of the nonprofit art spaces have closed. Uh, the television uh, venues are just virtually non-existent. Video festivals have ceased to exist and more traditional film festivals have taken their place. Um, and there's Vimeo and YouTube and a lot of ways to, to show on the, on the internet. And I would say today, I don't know a single artist who self-identifies as a video artist. Um, people will call themselves filmmakers, um, but artists who in the 80s and 90s, I think, were characterized by their use of video and time-based mediums have evolved into what is now more frequently defined as social practice artists. Uh, <clears throat> with video as one of the primary tools in, in their box. The idea of uh, the medium has generally been replaced, I think, by the idea of the social form. And social forms can range from games to surveillance systems to meals. Um, Fred Wilson states that his medium uh, is the social form of the museum. And uh, those social forms 
exist in time and, and, uh, and in some ways are the time-based media that we're working with today. And these artists, rather than creating alternatives to the established academy, are, I think, more frequently now working in collaboration with these institutions. Uh, together, artists and institutions frequently aim to be defined as the producers of culture by using new forms of technology, specifically in the arena of time-based recording, communications networks, and social media. Museums and schools invite and commission artists to engage in the larger community with their work. And again, if you look at CCA, um, it's dissolved, its video program doesn't exist, and it has established a social practice program in its place. The undergraduate media arts program has also been terminated, and a narrative film program is now in its place. And so what that means is that artists working with film or, or video, artists working with video who aren't art filmmakers wanting to create more Hollywood-oriented films, um, become independent majors and they're no longer actually in the department that I teach in, which is kind of an interesting shift. But in the graduate program, everything's interdisciplinary, with the exception of the social practice program, which has its distinct discipline. Um, the notion of experimental film or experimental documentary, I think, remains in, in museums, but really primarily as a recent historical reference, and there are definitely, you know, SF MoMA has regular screening nights where a single channel video and artist made film is shown. But whereas these screenings used to really be what defined the time based uh, programming of a museum, they are now part of a larger interdisciplinary context of work. Um, <clears throat> for me as an artist working during these developments, my own practice has really been remained rooted in time based media, and I continue to use video all the time. But the venue and structure of how the work is seen and distributed in its context of how it's understood, I think, has really changed. Um, in the 80s, um, not too long before the uh, 1993 biennial, um, I had a piece that was written about in this way. It was in recognition of her creativity, innovation, and contribution to the language of video, specifically through her unique approach to cultural issues. And I only mention that because I think it demonstrates that really at the time, the idea of working with, quote, cultural issues was considered unique, um, and it is definitely not now. And it was also considered really to be rooted in these time-based mediums like video. Um, my work was, was showing, and I was involved in a very vibrant network of uh, international artists um, and video festivals and exhibition spaces. Uh, and an example of this kind of pre-internet community that I think gathered around the, the video artists of the time was the opportunity that I had to work during a Fulbright grant in Belgrade um, in 1989 with Dunja Blažević, who was a really brilliant media, is still a really brilliant media programmer. I, she just sent me a care package. Um, and she produced at that time a one-hour program for TV Belgrade that was broadcast nationally throughout the former Yugoslavia. Um, the last Sunday of every month. Um, and it was a program that was a combination of original video art by a wide range of international well-known artists. Sanya Ivekovic, who's recently, you know, had that big show at MoMA, was uh, created work for, for uh, TV Galleria, uh, Gary Hill. I mean, the list kind of went on and on. And I think that, again, last night, you know, that the whole uh, uh, relationship to Eastern Europe and the work that was being done there was really important. It was, it was amazing to be a part of that, that community. And I worked producing programs for a full year until the takeover of TV, TV Belgrade by Slobodan Milosevic just before the war, and Dunja left and uh, was exiled from, from uh, Serbia. So in the 90s, I did fewer installations and began developing a more documentary-based practice. My documentary videos always relied on the participation of the people I was representing, um, uh, from the woman in prison who murdered her mother to the Los, Los Angeles businessman who took 15 American men to meet 500 Russian women on an international matchmaking vacation, um, or Turkish women establishing identity in a secular state. And I've never been a social practice artist, um, 
but I, like many of the artists coming out of the video art world of the 80s and 90s, I think incorporate some elements of what is now called social practice into their work, and always have. Um, so, let's see. Um, I never imagined when I came out of school, and I think Daniel also referenced this, that I would be represented by a commercial gallery. But in the late 90s, I was picked up by the Patricia Suito Gallery. And as is evident almost everywhere, um, you know, video shows and commercial galleries, these aren't alternative spaces. And the fact that this work has become commercially viable, I think, points to some sig significant changes that Jeffrey was, was referencing and questioning. Um, and, you know, there's very little desire in my students at CCA to exist outside of the academy and exist outside of the institutions. Um, my students at CCA are amazing and they inspire me every day. I love working with them. I feel honored that, that I, I get to work with these students. They are amazing artists. But, but it's a different world, you know, they're not, they're, it's not like my generation where we were seeking to create an alternative. They want to work within, within the establishment. Um, and I think this desire comes from a number of sources, obviously the sky high cost of education, um, the uh, lack of, of employment when one gets out, um, the incredible cost of living um, that, you know, I mean, when I left school I could live very, very cheaply in San Francisco, that's no longer possible. And, but I think there's another, I think there's another kind of interesting thing that's at play here. There used to, it used to be that artists and critics and curators and writers and the people, the business people associated with art came from a really diversified background. Um, who knows where they came from? Um, but in the last 15 years, CCA has developed a um, master's program in curatorial studies, uh, history, writing, an MA in business, um, visual criticism, and of course, they still have the, um, the fine arts degree. So all of a sudden, you now have the people who make the art, who um, write about the art, who curate the art, who historicize the art, uh, who curate the art, and the business people who sell the art, all coming out of the same institution. And I think that's not an insignificant change. And I'm really starting to believe that 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 very fact makes even imagining this kind of concept of alternative just, it's just a more complicated affair. It really is. Um, so um, I'm going to show documentation of two pieces of work um, that um, deal specifically with the shifting construction of time through new, new technologies and the social and cultural implications of those shifts. Both of these pieces are um, uh, projection works. Um, and I, they're not single channel films, although I still do make single channel videos. Um, so as an artist, I, I am understanding time, the time and time based, really to be twofold. There's the element that the experience of the work unfolds in time, and there's the notion of time as an era. Uh, 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 an era of time, the best of time, the worst of times. Um, and these two notions of, of time were really at the heart of this work by my collaborator, John Muse, and myself, that was commissioned by the Aldrich Museum. Um, the curator asked us to use uh, document, documentary strategies we had used in a, in a place called, um, in, a, in a work called Clockwork, where we use the intervalometer, which records a a uh, half second of video every, um, every 30 seconds. Uh, um, and we, for, the, for, the, for that piece, we left 24 hour cameras, multiple cameras running for 24 hours in workspaces where the work environment created um, intimacy between the worker and the client. And so we used a dentist office and a hairstylist. Um, I think you saw still the hairstylist a little earlier. So the curator saw that work and asked us to come to Ridgefield, Connecticut, where the Aldrich Museum is, which is an old uh, uh, revolutionary town. And he wanted us to apply that documentary strategy to, our, um, to a documentation of the town of Ridgefield in honor of the 
Ridgefield's 300th anniversary. So that was a, a, a tall bill for us. We were a little bit flummoxed on how to do that. And it took us about a year of research and interviews before we came up with the idea of bringing together three wanderers over each about 100 years apart that all shared a relationship to a cave just outside of town, the town of Ridgefield. And in our project, we sought to make evident how their wanderings demonstrated a completely different relationship to time and thus very different relationships to culture and society. Um, Sarah Bishop, the hermitess, before photography, so there's no real images of her, lived in the cave for almost 30 years just after the Revolutionary War. Her home and family were destroyed during the, the war, and um, there's all kinds of uh, mythologies around what happened to her between uh, the war and when she ended up in Ridgefield. Um, uh, but the fact was she lived in, in, in this cave for 30 years and wandered down into town to church for church where she would go to someone's house who had, would always lay out a series of dresses. She'd change her clothes, she'd go to church, and then she'd go back up to the cave. Um, and her wanderings were really timed around the sun and the moon and the days and the seasons. About 100 years later, the old leatherman, uh, who was called that because he wore a 60-pound leather suit, um, and the old leatherman lived outside as well, and he walked a 365-mile circuit through New York and Connecticut every 34 days without fail uh, between the years of 1856 and 1889. And when he passed through Ridgefield, he slept in the cave too. Um, it was said that the residents set their clocks by him and that um, people really, um, people set out food for him and every now and then he had to change his route when he got harassed because he did get harassed, um, but he was at it for a long time. And then a little more than 100 years after that, the contemporary residents of Ridgefield used their cell phones and GPS devices to clock their march down Main Street during that 300th anniversary parade that Ridgefield hosted. And members of the parade dressed up as Sarah Bishop and the Leatherman, and there was a float of the cave itself. Um, so John and I created three geocaching routes where participants using GPS devices and the geocaching website solved clues that we gave them on the website to find a series of hidden clues that followed three, these three different routes of these wanderers. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what a geocache is, there's over a million geocaches worldwide. Um, there's one on the top of Mount Everest. There's another. There's others at the bottom of the sea. Um, and people from all walks of life participate in finding them and logging them on this geocaching website. Um, our geocaching route gave historical information about the wanderers and their routes uh, in the clues and eventually brought the geocachers to a box outside the museum. They had to open a lock on the box using their clues and obtain a compass from within the box which gave them free entrance to the museum. Um, the routes are still active even, the show, even though the show's been down for a bit. Um, and initially we really wanted the geocaches to lead to the cave, but it was on private property. We had a phone call with the owner who we, we thought, but instead it was her lawyer who said if we stepped foot on the property she would um, sue us. So we decided to create a proxy cave in the gallery um, where we use video projection, audio narration, and sculptural elements um, to evoke the time frame of these wanderers. Um, uh, the cave rotated and cast these really immense shadows on the wall. Video projection circled the room like an observatory, and the 24 hours of the anniversary parade day was condensed to five minutes, the parade itself taking about 20 seconds worth of time um, of that uh, 20 minutes. Uh, um, uh, and so the viewer was guided by those geocaching routes from the paths of the wanderers into the gallery and experienced different ways of keeping time and moving through space. 
Uh, um, so it's video art, but it brings together social forms like the parade, the journey, the hermitage, the observatory. We use video, but the larger medium in each of the components is a way of living and acting really and experiencing the world. The parade is a particular social form, but we don't represent it in cinematic terms as much as recreate the moment of time within the, the framework of a 24-hour period. Um, so I know I'm really short on time, so I don't know if I have time to show the last piece. Um, yeah, you think so? Um, this is a piece I did at the Camargo Foundation in Cassis, France, uh, which is just east of Marseille. It um, is right on the water, and my studio overlooked the water, so I, I stared out every day. Um, to see, and at one moment it dawned on me that my mother, 65 years or so earlier, um, had uh, sat um, out on a Red Cross ship during the invasion of southern France and was staring at exactly the spot where I was sitting in my studio. Um, and so I called my mother and interviewed her via Skype about her experiences. She was 90 at the time. And, um, uh, um, and I also collected quotes from my friend who was writing a book about Napoleon during his years um, in the area and uh, the war that, that he was engaged in at that time. So I projected, um, uh, let's see, in the window, it, you, there's another image embedded in the window, um, and the projection could be viewed from the interior and the exterior. Um, and um, uh, so I'm running out of time. I'm just going to just show really quick a little clip, bit, a snippet of the video, so you get a sense of what it was like. The uh, quotes from Napoleon run across um, the the room and. Um, there's the audio was uh, the the my mother who was actually struggling to tell a story, with but pulling on, and the Red Cross has lighted up on the each side of the ship. The ship stayed blacked out because we had to alert the enemy and to the fact that we were going to in on an invasion. Southern France, along with Babylon. I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop. But I just say those little boats that you see were, I look at those out my window every day because every fourth grader in Casitz learns how to sail. <laughs> so those are the fourth graders going out to sea. So it was a, there was an attempt to kind of collapse these kind of references and understandings of war onto this building called La Batterie where Napoleon slept, actually. This is a building that Napoleon had actually slept in. Um, so I'm out of time, I'm gonna stop, but thank you all very much. So uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Nora Alter, who's chair and professor of film and media arts at Temple University. Her teaching and research has been focused on 20th and 21st century uh, cultural practice across a broad range of media, including theater, poetry, film, and art. Her books include Vietnam Protest Theater, The Television War on Stage from 1996, Projecting History, Nonfiction German Film from 2002, Chris Marker, 2006, and is co-editor with uh, Lutz Kopnik of Sound Matters, Essays on Acoustics of Modern German Culture from 2004. Nora's published essays on a range of media artists, including Rene Green, Harun Faroki, Matthias Polda, Hans Hacke, Stan Douglas, and others. Uh, uh, Professor Alter is completing a new book on the international essay film and has begun research on a new study devoted to sound. Welcome. Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Jeffrey and to thank Shannon for inviting me to participate in this event, as well as to Sarah and to Laura for all their help in all kinds of uh, logistical details that continue to this very second. Um, <laughs> 
Originally, when Jeffrey and I spoke, I was going to present something on Harun Faroqi and basically to examine the development of his practice of montage as it metamorphized from single to multiple channel projections concomitant with his move from independent filmmaking um, to producing, independent filmmaking often producing for television to um, becoming a visual artist working in a three-dimensional space. However, like um, Rebecca mentioned earlier, I had second thoughts. <laughs> um, and this was actually prompted um, by the prompt that we received um, for the post, which made me really start to think about the topic um, at hand and sort of looking at who the other participants were. And I thought, well, um, maybe we could, if people want to, we could discuss Faroki later um, during the discussion period. But I wanted to take um, the actually sort of tackle head on this idea of time based art um, and film. So as I pondered the topic, I started to think about the topic of sound. And sound sort of kept coming back to me. How does one install sound? So I decided that today I would rather focus on sound um, and just in its sort of very kind of multifaceted perspective. And I'm also talking about sound as a cinematic practice um, that includes celluloid, video, and digital, but not sound art, um, as we had heard about some sound art earlier today. So I'd like to first mention, begin with two quotations. Uh, the first is from Jean-Luc Nancy, and it says, quote, what is at play in listening? What resonates in it? What is the tone of listening or its timbre? Is even listening sonorous? And the second one is from sound phenomenologist Don Ide, who says, quote, an inquiry into the auditory is also an inquiry into the invisible. Listening makes the invisible present in a way similar to the presence of the mute in vision. And now I'm going to read to you um, the post that I came up with last week for those of you who have not had a chance to go to the blog. Don DeLillo's 2010 novel, Point Omega, opens and closes with a lengthy meditation by a nameless character on Douglas Gordon's 24-hour psycho of 1993. The first section plunges the reader into a detailed observation of Gordon's video sculpture as it was installed on the sixth floor of New York's MoMA in September 2006. An anonymous man, who turns out to be the narrator, describes the darkened, seatless setting in which he encounters the work, the impasse of guards, the bewildered tourists, and the effect of watching Hitchcock's 1960 suspense film reprojected as a 24-hour long artwork. In particular, DeLillo's narrator ponders the effects of slowness, the changes in perception brought about by the manipulation of the speed of projection. He contrasts the conventional understanding of Hitchcock's classic to the meanings produced by Gordon's version in which every movement is amplified and each detail made more apparent. This is at core of what separates art and entertainment, muses DeLillo's protagonist. The difference between an art installation and a Hollywood movie has largely to do with the speed of perception. Art deliberately slows down and complicates viewing in order to challenge the spectator to rethink and refeel form and experience. Entertainment does the opposite, accelerating and simplifying viewing so that the observer before the spectacle does not have to think about or feel very much anything at all. From the point of view of the protagonist of Point Omega, 24-hour psycho underscores the concept of time in the cinematic. However, one integral component of the time-based medium of film is left out of this equation, sound. The latter is an element that since 1927 at least has been mobilized to measure, regulate, order, suture, and structure movement. But sound, unlike images, is much more difficult to slow down, to speed up, or to still without a significant loss of coherency and a fundamental alteration of meaning. This presumably is why Gordon felt the need to project 24-hour psycho silently. Sound is unforgiving. It is the time-based sense reliant on movement for its existence. As the narrator reflects in Jean-Luc Godard's 1991 Germany or 990, can one recount time, 
time as such in and of itself. No, in truth, it would be an insane undertaking, a bit like holding on to a single note or chord for an hour and trying to pass it off as music. The question I want to pose at this conference is, what is lost or gained, as the case may be, when the ephemeral movement and time-based phenomenon that is sound is framed, channeled, and put on display in an art venue? I'm going to divide my presentation into two parts. The first will sketch out some salient features of sound, and the second will provide a series of examples of different ways in which the oral component has been foregrounded in audiovisual installations. Writing in 1911, Ricciotto Canudo in The Birth of the Sixth Art hypothesizes that film has the potential to be the, quote, superb conciliation of the rhythm of space the plastic arts, and the rhythm of time, music and poetry. He continues to emphasize that the new manifestation of art, film in this case, should really be more precisely a painting and a sculpture developing in time, as in music and poetry. In addition to adding another spatial dimension, sound, and especially music, also enhances movement and temporality. An image can be frozen, can be static, like a sculpture. But in order for music to come into being, it must be played. As has been stressed by Godard's narrator, music like time must move forward in order to exist. As has been amply noted, the etymology of cinema goes back to the Greek word for music. It is a double movement, not only the movement that is suggested within the frame, but also the movement of the frames of celluloid as they pass through both the camera and the projector. Since music has to move in order to exist, perhaps it is more closely an inherent and integral part of cinema than images. As sound theoretician Michel Chion observes in contrast to vision, sound presupposes movement from the outset. He continues, as the trace of a movement or a trajectory, sound thus has its own temporal dynamic. The Don Inde, phenomenologist Don Inde, underscores that unlike the visual field, the auditory field is not a static field. Brazilian filmmaker Alberto Cavalcante observes, pictures speak to the intelligence. Noise seems to bypass the intelligence and speaks to something very deep and inborn. The picture lends itself to clear statement, while sound lends itself to suggestions." Unquote. Images and the visual more generally are easier to discern, locate, pin down, than that ephemeral domain of sound. While an image may be stable, sound is fleeting, unbounded. That which is visible is locatable. Sound, in contrast, surrounds. Even when emitting from one source, such as a speaker or headphones, when it enters the atmosphere, it quickly disperses. Sound has been linked as being intimately connected to the unconscious, unwittingly affecting the psyche. In response to Walter Benjamin's theory of an optical unconscious that reveals itself through the medium of photography and film, Siegfried Krakauer developed a theory of an acoustic unconscious. Like those optical signs that emerge and, single and signal concomitantly to the past, present, and even future, unconscious sonic traces, chords, notes flow through history and its representations. Sounds serve as oral madeleines that uncontrollably trigger memories. In Benjamin's recollection of his childhood in Berlin, he reflects more than images, sounds lead back to the past. Quote, all these pictures I have preserved, but none would bring back New Lake and a few hours of my childhood so vividly as to hear once more the bars of music. Finally, to return to Godard from a much earlier film of his, here and elsewhere, sound traces, sound traces often provide access to the tenor of different times and spaces. They allow us to hear elsewhere, which in turn enable us to see and understand elsewhere as well. So now I'm going to just sort of go through a few strategies, which is also sort of a history of, um, brief history of sort of installing sound film and some sort of important features um, that come up. In 1966, Andy Warhol's Chelsea Girls, a split screen film, pushed the intersection of sound film and projection in a new direction. 
Here the soundtrack determines the montage of the two screens. The film made up of various unedited scenes of unforgettable mayhem, mostly shot in the rooms of the Chelsea Hotel in New York City, is comprised of 12 35-minute reels, two of which are projected at any given time. Each of the reels has recorded sound, however, during the screening. Only one soundtrack is played at a time. Warhol left the decision of the order in which the reels would be projected, how they would be paired, and which of the two would run with sound at any particular moment to the film's projectionist. Thus, the composition of this film is significantly different at every screening. But what I want to highlight here is that the particular screen that commands the viewer's attention at any given moment is determined by which one of the two runs with sound. The sound element, which Warhol recorded live as it happened in the rooms, heightens the film's immediacy and drives not only the narrative of the film, but also the viewer's perception. Um, and this idea of sound affecting um, montage and the visual plane was, of course, theorized much earlier in the beginning of the 30s by Rudolf Arnheim, who made this argument that sound basically shatters visual montage, because suddenly you have a speaking person that's going to take, take your, um, your attention towards that person or that figure. A similar tactic, though not quite as radical since the role of the projectionist was not nearly as crucial as in Warhol's film, was used in 1975 by Godard and Anne-Marie Mieville in Number Two, in which the screen is split into as many as four sections. And again, we just sort of follow our attentions drawn to very subtle amplifications of the soundtrack. The practice of showing multiple images simultaneously has recently resurfaced in a proliferation of multi-screen multiple screen projected image installations in galleries and museums. Once again, it is the soundtrack, soundtrack of these multi-screen experiments that drives the viewer's experience of the montage. But now, in many of these gallery installations, the montage is three-dimensional, as the screens are spread throughout the gallery space, which in turn not only shifts the filmic components away from the primacy of the visual and toward oral and tactile realms, but employs sound to sculpt the site of the exhibition and to direct the viewer through the space of the work. The effect is something like that of a mobile montage as the gallery visitor is led through the space, through the built environment, from screen to screen by audio cues. For example, Stan Douglas's or Champ off screen of 1992 consisted of a double-sided screen on which two separate but related image tracks are projected. A single soundtrack unifies the two visual recordings. The sound surrounds the spectator. There's no single focal point as in the visual. The two-sided nature of the installation emphasizes the limits of vision. Sound, in contrast, does not have borders. In both sets of images, Douglas's camera captures jazz musicians playing their instruments. One is the official authorized version, whereas the other, like a B-side of a record, consists of all the outtakes that were never used, those left off screen or hors champ. The title of the work thus connotes sound that is off screen out of the recorded visual frame. However, there is more. As Stan Douglas explains, Orchamp presents the performance of four American musicians who either lived in France during the free jazz movement or who still reside there today. Their presence in that country may be considered continuous with the history of black American musicians emigrating to France, which extends back at least as far as the arrival of Josephine Baker and Sidney Bechet on European soil. The music they play is based on Albert Eiler's 1965 composition, Spirits Rejoice, and is composed of four basic music materials, a gospel melody, an attenuated call and response, a heraldic fanfare, of La, and La Marseillaise. The soundtrack thus pushes the double screen sculpture into a historical political trajectory. And there are many other um, examples that I could give of the way um, sound is installed through multi-screens. Um, but moving back a bit, um, of course, not all contemporary film exhibits are multi-screen installations. There also have been a considerable number of productions in which the cinematic apparatus itself almost becomes a sculpture, or at least sculptural. Um, and here I'm thinking of Valley Export's Abstract Film Number no. 1 of 1967, 
which consisted of running a film projector mounted on a white pedestal and installed in a museum space. There was no celluloid strip in the projector. It only projected light into, onto a mirror on the back wall. Displayed and mounted in this fashion, the cinematic machine became a represented subject, a sculpture, and at the same time, sculpture became a projecting object. No longer out of sight or hidden in the projection booth, the projector was located in the middle of the exhibition space. In this otherwise silent film, the only noise the spectator could hear was the whirring of the empty projector, recalling Ian Christie's appellation of cinema as the last machine. And it's, a very, it's also a similar effect of whirring that one gets from um, Anthony McCall's line describing a cone of 1973, for those of you who know that work. Uh, since the mid-1990s, video installations and sound sculptures have been pervasive in contemporary art. Um, media artist Christian Markley, and a lot of this was also mentioned um, by Jean just prior to me. It's like the whole effect of um, new technologies and new media have really facilitated um, that move. Media artist Christian Markley has produced several projects that examine the interrelationship of film, video art, and sound. His 1995 Telephones consists of a sound collage of short movie extracts of easily recognizable voices of actors talking on the phone. Markley's four-screen, 14-minute looped video quartet of 2002 montages clips from films in which various musical instruments and songs are featured. The sound is carefully synchronized as a numero due and the viewer's attention is directed by which screens have been amplified at any moment. In his installation, Crossfire of 2007, the spectator is placed within a total sound visual system. Both images and soundtracks are played from violent films, so you just walk into this four screen area, um, uh, by directors such as Tarantino, De Palma, Scorsese, and Peckinpah. The spectator is caught in an audiovisual shootout or crossfire. More powerful than the images are the, at times, deafening explosions on the soundtrack. Um, in another work, Guitar Drag, Markley recalls the horrific incident in 1998 in Jasper, Texas, when James Burr Jr. was brutally beaten, painted, and then dragged by a pickup truck along a two and a half mile strip of country road until his body literally fell apart. In guitar drag, Markley drags an electric guitar connected to an amplifier along that same strip of road. The increasingly jarring nose noises as the guitar is, des is destroyed acoustically recall the dismembered body of James Baird. So the violence in the history becomes performed through that acoustic um, component. Another way of installing sound is to create separate listening spaces. Rene Green's standardized octagonal units for imagined and existing systems extends the film, field of film, video, and sculpture into the highly ephemeral domain of pure sound sculpture. Also known as SOUs, this work was first installed in the expansive gardens of the palace, of the palace in Kassel, Germany during Documenta 11. Interspersed throughout the wooded park were eight sculpture pavilions each equipped with a listening bench and a sound system broadcasting a recording of a voice whispering the names of places such as real and fantastical islands. So she constructs these pavilions. Um, during the evenings in particular, the pavilions could only be detected by tracking their barely perceptible murmurings. One pavilion included a monitor on which played a 53-minute video loop entitled Elsewhere. Um, but the other units offered very little visual stimulus, transporting the visitor instead to imaginary places solely via sound. The visual component in these units was left to the visitor's imagination and, of course, to a certain extent, to the memory of the one unit with the videotape. Okay. But at the same time, the sound units point towards pure sound installations and sound art. Green blurred the boundary between film, videotape, sculpture, and sound, exploring the temporal and spatial and sonic dimensions that come into full fruition with the development of a sound art that expands sculpture significantly beyond the visual and into a predominantly acoustical space. Um, so Janet Cardiff and George Miller play with the relationship of sound to the um, imaginary. So in two fairly recent pieces. One is called Cabin Fever, 
And the way cabin fever works is that you basically um, find, they install to size an archaic diorama reminiscent of early Nickelodeon viewing cabinets, which beckons the viewer to look into it. So you look into this diorama, and through it you see a snow-covered cabin nestled amongst the trees. The title, evocative of B-horror films, Cabin Fever, suggests a pending atrocity. So you look in, and this is what you see. And then on the soundtrack, um, it's a bioral soundtrack, so you have to wear um, headsets, and you hear a car driving up. It's just this very, you know, pronounced um, soundtrack. Um, a car drives up, feet crunch on the snow. You hear the voices of a couple having an argument, which is actually a track from The Godfather. A plate breaks, there's a gunshot, and then you hear the footsteps walking away, and a car drives off. Um, so the whole thing, meanwhile, nothing is happening on the visual track. It's completely static. So in contrast to the static visual scene, the acousmatic scene involves multiple layers and tracks. The natural forest sounds, the rumble of a car, footsteps crunching in the snow. Um, from the cabins we hear, the dishes broken, couple arguing, gunshot. Um, although the image has remained the same, an entire scene has been acoustically generated. The bioral binaural recording um, spatializes sound. One can clearly distinguish sounds outside the cabin, footsteps, nature, car, from those within, dialogue and telephone. Sound, textured and layers, draws the spectator from her position outside the box, looking in to inside the winterscape, an auditory witness who, through listening, discovers a hidden narrative. Um, Okay, and um, in another one of their works, I think we saw there was a telephone. Yes. So you have um, these very old sort of 1950s, early 60s Hollywood-style telephones. This is also a little similar to Markley. And you pick them up and you listen to dreams, to fantasies um, of a woman's voice who's describing scenes, which are often very cinematographic. Okay, I'm almost... Uh, finishing. Of course, um, another important dimension of sound is silence. Okay, and so that's the other part is um, silence becomes almost the way you would have a shadow, um, a contouring shadow to visual. Silence becomes that contouring contrast, that other side of sound. And many artists also use sound quite a bit. One example that I had was um, Mateus Paledna did a piece, and um, it was called Suffer and Suffer's Version. And in one instance, it's projected completely silently. So all you see are these bodies that are moving to the effect that it almost becomes like an abstract film. And then in the second um, version of it, he has a soundtrack in which he's actually, the soundtrack is a song um, by De La A, and it's all about... Um, colonialism, um, the whole idea of the sufferer, what does a sufferer mean? So again, the kind of history and that specific island Caribbean history becomes inflected through the soundtrack um, in contrast just to the visual track. So he kind of brings that out um, by emphasizing first the silence and then what happens when you actually play the music with it. Finally, I'd like to end with a brief excursus into speech, and especially those sounds that erupt unconsciously and that are barely detectable or often pass unnoticed. How does one salvage, recuperate, and store vocal intonations, pauses in speech, silences? Those sonic byproducts or detritus, what is sometimes referred to as noise. How to restore and remember in particular that language produced by the voice but composed of non-linguistic sounds such as laughing, crying, hiccuping, coughing, sighing, and the like. Such an important project is at stake in the work, for example, of Esther Shalov Gertz. In tandem with her investigations in the recuperation of history and memory of events, the Holocaust, migrations, modernity, um, transformations of a post-industrial society. She's also interested not just in the linguistic stories, but in the silences. So in this um, piece here, which is called um, Between Listening and Telling, Last Witnesses, Auschwitz of 2005, um, you don't hear 
what the witness is saying. And what she has done is she's taken every single moment in when they are not speaking and she's montaged them together. So these are all their silences. So their silences in between their acts of telling and witnessing. If you want to hear them, that's also provided um, with um, headsets in a completely different location. But just she's trying to capture that which is often disappears. Let's go to another one. So in this um, one, it's called Whiteout, and it's. Is that Whiteout? No, no. Is that Whiteout? Okay, so this is your entering into, okay, here it is, white out, should come up. Um, for white out, she found a, this is in Sweden, a Sami person who is the indigenous population of Sweden and who also had basically integrated and lived in Stockholm. And what she did, was that in the woman in green on the right hand side, it's the same woman, and the one sitting down, she's in her apartment, and she's reading a series of quotations by other people about Sami culture. And she's also commenting on her own memories growing up and on those quotations, to what extent are they cliches, where is the reality? And then she takes the woman, and then the other um, image that you saw of the woman is she, um, goes with her to where she grew up, up into the country in the woods, and she films her listening to herself. So it's just her response of reacting kind of to herself. And what do we do when we listen to ourselves speak? And how is that act of listening to oneself, where oneself almost becomes other, how does that kind of register um, audiovisually? So these are just, you know, I sort of went through sort of different examples of what happens kind of if one sort of takes apart um, audiovisual, separates the sound and image track, and how various filmmakers and artists are really working with sound as a way of providing um, a different register, a different track, and often one in which um, politics is located and is sound is sounded um, and where silence also becomes as important. Okay, so. Uh, our next panelist is um, uh, the Berkeley Art Museum's very own uh, uh, Steve Side, who is a curator, uh, been a curator here for over 20 years. Uh, he's helped grow the video art collection and conducted preservation for numerous artists, including William Wegman, Paul Cause, the National Center for Experiments in Television, Ant Farm, and others. He is, and I quote, an occasional writer on things moving, unquote. I'm going to be very brief and informal, um, and um, so I was asked more or less to think about the origins of video art, where it comes from, and maybe discuss uh, the implications of what happened when video art and video installation began to infiltrate the museum, what the disruption was, and uh, uh, this, you know, I'll kind of meander about, uh, and then a lot of that will end in the 90s when there's a major shift that Jean uh, talked about, um, not just with social practice, although that comes a little bit later, but um, the kind of monetizing of the form and how uh, the gallery starts to rear its ugly head and uh, um, uh, the, the sh you know, the shift in production completely moves away from what it had been. I, you know, in my early days, early days, um, I uh, worked at the Bay Area Video Coalition, and uh, this was at a time when it had a completely different mission, which was actually to create alternative 
uh, uh, works that you know hopefully would be injected into culture and change something that um, that has gone away uh, and in many ways uh, the dissemination of video art uh, in, with that kind of intent has also gone away um, and uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well and also how you know uh, uh, my this, this this podium right here is actually I guess the second phase of my career uh, uh, I went from a kind of world of alternative media and then into a building of some stature, uh, and that was when we were um, still projecting from this space. So what I'm going to do, though, is I, I thought the easiest way to talk about the origins, uh, and I apologize for this, is to talk about Namjoon Paik, uh, just because he kind of embodies a lot of the tendencies that would kind of play out in the 70s and the 80s. So it kind of puts things in place quite conveniently. What I don't want to do is kind of create a foundational myth about Paik, because when I really started uh, curating in the earlier 80s, there was a huge huge kind of heated debate uh, because he had ascended, uh, he had had, uh, I guess it was around the time he had his first big retrospective at the Whitney, uh, and um, he was like overshadowing everybody else, and um, there was a strong resistance to this notion of a, a kind of founder, but also that he was a founding father. Um, and uh, he was deposed quite uh, heavily in the, in the early 80s. But he's still very convenient, and he was still quite brilliant. Um, and so tracking him is kind of a, a nice thing to do. Now, so this whole notion of time um, slipping into the museum is kind of a, a erroneous idea. Time has always been in the museum. Uh, there are different kinds of time. I think maybe the, the category I would put the original time in the museum was the voluntary time because you kind of came and went and you, you know, your response time to a work of art was generated in part by yourself. Not wholly. I mean, I'm sure that like a painting, you know, paintings in, in their own uh, way are often narrative or they have compositional elements that require a kind of uh, serializing in the way that you uh, ingest them so that, uh, and sculpture requires that you explore the back end. So there's nothing in which there's like an instantaneous absorption of a work of art. There's always been some element of time. And I imagine that, and I hope that when a painter is, is, is in front of his canvas, that he is not imagining that the viewer has some kind of instantaneous recognition of what's going on there. Otherwise, why spend the time? Um, so maybe, maybe what we're talking about voluntary time being displaced by a more dictatorial time, a time that is insisting upon itself. But even within the time-based arts, there are many times that you have to think about. I mean, there is, if, it's, if we're thinking about video, there is the kind of duration of a, of a work, uh, which could be single channel. Um, uh, uh, or say in the in the wonderful days of the early 70s, a lot of performative works that were videotaped, the the duration was the length of the tape. You would do some action until you got to 60 minutes, and the tape would run out. Uh, so there were the intentional uh, and the unintentional durations. There is a kind of tempo that you set up within a narrative that has its own timing, but that sits on top of 60 fields. And that is, is determining something. It's a machine time that is driving the whole thing. So there's, very, there's experiential uh, and aesthetic time, and that sits on top of a kind of machine time. So somehow that worked its way into, um, into the gallery. Now, Paik, um, just biographically, some quick stuff about Paik. Born in Korea uh, in the late 30s, his, uh, I mean in the early 30s, his family uh, uh, left Korea during the Korean War in the earlier 50s. They moved to Japan. He is schooled in Tokyo, uh, gets his degree there, 
In the later 50s, around 57 or so, uh, he moves to Munich and pursues uh, an, a higher level of academic uh, pursuit, uh, writing about Schoenberg. But he's also at the same time a musician and he's performing. And he comes under the sway of a bunch of subversive guys. Uh, it's a scene that's going on that is being influenced by Stockhausen and Boys and Cage and people like Wolf Volstel, who he would become closely aligned with. Uh, so this is the, the world he's operating in. At this point, uh, in the, the mid and late 50s, he's more into kind of um, uh, actions against the instruments. So he is starting to destroy pianos and violins uh, and do very uh, energetic performative works, writing scores, but often kind of undermining his own work. Um, so that, that is where he is. But then he starts looking around at other things. Um, I think through those, uh, the, through people like Vostel, who around 1958 had already done kind of quasi-installations where he had inserted television sets that were just playing live uh, broadcast television. Um, he uh, kind of acquires this taste for pursuing um, television. Now, so one of the first things that influences him is mass culture. Now, I always want to wonder why uh, he went after uh, video rather than, or television rather than um, uh, film, because they're, they're both kind of equally uh, popular and mass and industrial. Um, but I like to think that um, uh, earlier on, film was able to somewhat legitimize itself and that it was voluntary, uh, that you went to the theater, whereas television by its nature was much more corporatized even in the beginning, and it was invasive. It was dropped into your living room. Um, you know, there was a, a, a center in San Francisco, the very first television lab uh, called the National Center for Experiments in Television, and their director, Bryce Howard, who came out of uh, national educational television thought that there was something uh, fundamentally wrong with television, that something that could penetrate domestic space was just all wrong. Um, and so the, the, at the National Center, they went about uh, corrupting the efforts as much as they could, and they uh, shifted their emphasis away from uh, content programming and directly into image processing. That's another story. But it's also, I think, why uh, someone like Paik would have pushed film aside and pursued uh, television because of this way in which it was able to emplace itself in domestic space. Then the other thing, obviously, is we have um, a, a kind of reflex that's already in place within the avant-garde, which is, you know, the detourment or décollage, as was being uh, uh, bandied about, and which would really pick up force in the 60s, uh, you know, through uh, De Boer uh, and through Fluxus in taking popular culture and uh, unraveling it, collaging it, destroying it, revealing other, other meaning. And then, of course, he's, he's coming out of a kind of art background, so he's thinking about uh, uh, sculpture, and he's thinking about that, those early moments in which uh, kind of traditional media are being uh, pushed aside, and, the, and the, the 60s are just on, on, the, uh, on the horizon with their interest in um, jettisoning objects in favor of, of more conceptual uh, actions. So all these things are kind of swirling around in the late, late 50s with a, uh, a somewhat youthful um, Nam June Paik. Now, one of the things that holds him back at this point is that uh, the technology is not uh, something that's reachable. Um, television had really begun its big broadcast efforts in the 40s, but, but uh, at that point, 
Um, there was no such thing as videotape. Uh, there was no such thing as, as uh, creating programs like that except creating them live and then uh, kinescoping them or uh, making them on film and broadcasting them through a film chain. It wasn't until 57, 58 that Ampex uh, developed uh, videotape and then video cameras were paired with that and finally you could make a born in video product. Uh, but uh, two-inch machines were ensconced in uh, television uh, studios that had no interest whatsoever in uh, working with artists. There were one or two kind of aberrant efforts in Germany and France in the later 50s, and they didn't come to much. And it was not until 1967, 68, when the TV labs in the United States were launched. And then that effort really picked up steam. So in, in, at this point, rather than having your hands on the apparatus, what you do is you find some kind of symbolic aspect that you can detourn. So he finds the television set, which is the most obvious consumer manifestation. Uh, and he begins to uh, manipulate television sets. He learned very early on that the circuitry could be somewhat uh, manipulated. The, the, the most obvious and most beautiful efforts were when he was using magnets. But uh, years later, he would say, there are as many electric circuits as there are French cheeses. And it was very true. And he learned how to kind of broaden uh, his manipulation of the television set. Then we get to 1963. Uh, he has done a couple of isolated uh, displays of televisions that have uh, warped images on them. They often look kind of like um, oscilloscope images, you know, where you've actually stopped the cathode ray from properly sending electrons out and they kind of get brought into abstract shapes. But in this case, in Wuppertal in 1963, with, uh, I think, the participation of Wolf Volstel, he does this show in which it's a whole bunch of strewn television sets and different kinds of uh, image manipulation. And what I always loved about this is it almost appeared that his energy was much greater than the project could contain. So rather than having a kind of orderly display, he just threw them about uh, and then allowed you to kind of wander through the room Maybe this is the first legitimate um, and ambitious uh, uh, installation of this sort. So then in 1963 into 64, somewhere in there, he moves to the United States, uh, in part because he wants to join up with the Fluxus movement, which is picking up steam. I'm not sure if it's called Fluxus then. Is it already called Fluxus by 63, 64? Um, but he, so he comes to New York to join them. But he's also quickly realizing that there are different directions that you can go. There is the manipulation of objects and there is the creation of signal. Uh, and so he begins to pursue that in all their different variations. He also begins, he realizes that there is kind of sculptural objects and there are Objects sometimes in multiple, in complexity, that uh, occupy space, recognize architecture. So he spreads out in that direction as well. So in, in the beginning, he first starts to do um, single channel works, uh, not really uh, creating images of his own yet, but still manipulating the television. Uh, circuitry to get uh, distorted imagery out of it. He begins to, uh, uh, within a couple of years, to create a robot, um, which then takes on whole other forms later on, and uh, starts anticipating multi-channel works. So some of the first things that he's doing are like this. And, here he has a, uh, a, a conveniently ready-made television set called the Rembrandt, uh, which he just turns on its, 
on its uh, top, on its screen, and calls it Rembrandt Automatic. Uh, this is a, a sort of a thing that other people would pick up years later. Doug, Douglas Davis in the later 60s would take a television and place it against the wall, and you just kind of see the fluctuating light uh, playing out from it. But Paik did this in 63, and the television set was live. I think also around this time, there was a happening in upstate New York where they um, buried a television set that was plugged in. So it was, this was the kind of birth, and already it was anticipating its death uh, and burial. Uh, the, other, the other image is w the kind of classic thing that he was really perfecting, you know, 63, 64, 65, this idea that you could just create almost like beautiful synthetic waveforms inside the television. Um, uh, and I'll show you uh, some more grandiose versions of this uh, as we get along. But then the robots. The robots go in this direction, and they get kind of ridiculous. Um, and they, in a certain way, became uh, a kind of mercenary uh, offshoot of what he was doing. He actually, in the 90s, uh, maybe even in the 80s, but definitely in the 90s, had scouts running around the United States going to um, goodwill shops and looking for antique televisions. And he amassed this uh, warehouse filled with these things and he was just cranking out robots which sold very nicely and funded a lot of his efforts. But, um, you know, they began with kinetic sculpture that was kind of interesting as an element within a performance, and he would use them on the streets of cities and then kind of push that aside and went for these kind of static and, and kind of self-parodies. Okay, so ne then he starts getting into this idea that he can do... Um, multi-channel works, that he can do uh, works that are spreading out and absorbing enormous acreage uh, in the galleries. Um, and there are in several interesting things about that. One is that he starts uh, putting on uh, pieces that simply cannot exist in the alternative world anymore. The resources that are needed to mount a lot of these shows require the heft of a museum. Uh, so in certain ways, to follow the, the uh, route of his production, he has to kind of up the ante and find support amongst uh, bigger and bigger entities. And this, uh, as you'll see in the, by the 90s, just becomes kind of perverse. When, when he had gained his enormous stature uh, in the 90s, it matched that moment when the Korean economy really started to take off. And he became the darling of companies like Samsung. So they would literally um, give him 200 television sets so he could do a 200 channel piece somewhere. And so uh, having that kind of access just in a sense exploded the kinds of works that he could do. But the other thing about, you know, that, that I really hadn't mentioned is that um, the museum loves these kinds of pieces for another reason, though, and that is because it sucks you in. I'm, I remember in the early, early 90s, right out in the lobby there, I did um, an exhibition of uh, kind of primitive video games designed by artists. And I had, you know, some, some really rudimentary computers out there and little joysticks. But people would come in and they would sit there for an hour. And the museum loved it because typically they see people kind of at jogging speed going by paintings. Uh, and there's a, a, a real instinct in the building to hold you there. Um, and they found that time base uh, is not only seductive, but it requires your, your patience, your time. And, uh, you know, they, there have been surveys done about the length of time the average patron spends in front of a painting, and it's obscenely short. But when you put someone in front of a videotape, well, walk them through a viola installation or something, you have them there. It's just like television. So then he moves on to works like this. This is, um, this is his clock, many, many years before Christian Marclay, um, where he simply, again, is uh, 
placing uh, of something to deflect the scan of the cathode ray and creating these little lines and then aligning them so that you have all phases of the day. But this is still at that, at that point in which uh, it's really a display unto itself. It's not uh, necessarily interacting with the architecture or the scale of the museum. Then he gets to this phase. Uh, this, this is kind of a modern version of Fish Flies in the Sky, which is um, uh, from the late, late, late 60s. Oh. And um, when he originally did it, uh, he would use many, many monitors, but they would be kind of arrayed all about uh, the ceiling. So it required a, a, a something that was unusual for a museum, which was not only to have to uh, deal with the superstructure to uh, contain this sort of a thing. But if you look at a museum like ours, this place was put up in 1970. And they, at that point in time, they really weren't considering the idea of electronics entering the theater so that uh, our concrete walls don't allow uh, new cabling to be uh, run or to be concealed. The uh, electrical outlets are very few and often in, in completely ridiculous positions, you know, so that you end up with uh, a whole other kind of infrastructure having to be created to support something like this, not only with the technological know-how of the preparators, which wasn't required before that, but literally just ways of concealing uh, hardware and um, making the means of production disappear if that was what was required. This is TV Garden. Uh, it's, it's not a great shot, but this is, uh, the way he would install it is you, he would have a depression in a gallery space, so you were looking down into this, and it was filled with dozens and dozens and dozens of big kind of leafy tropical plants. Um, so then you would have something like this, where now the preparators uh, have to also um, have a kind of green thumb, uh, where they have to come in and water. And, they, and if the museum is going to buy it, what, are they, what exactly are they buying? Are they buying uh, the plant type? Uh, uh, are they required in 30 years to track down the same species of plant as well as uh, the same kind of television uh, tube? Um, uh, you know, an interesting thing, I remember when uh, uh, Paik had his retrospective at the Whitney and he had his famous aquarium piece where he has dozens of aquariums with monitors behind them and every morning the preparators had to come in and scoop out all the dead fish because the monitors were overheating the water and it killed the fish. But they made sure to do it, you know, to clean it out before opening hours. So then simultaneously he started getting into the, um, the, the production of the images themselves. I only have two minutes. Um, and what he did that was very uncanny is, is several things. One is in the late 60s, 1969, he introduced the Peik Abe synthesizer. This was at a moment where a lot of synthesizers were being developed. The Root Etra, the Dan Sandine synthesizer, the Beck Direct video synthesizer. Uh, just uh, there was a whole effort in the late 60s and into the early 70s to build hardware. Uh, the, the limitations of what the, the average television studio had were quite amazing, so this was required. But what Pake also did was he would do kind of sensual edits of junky footage. He would uh, rip uh, stuff off of uh, television broadcasts, often not particularly interesting footage in itself, but he would synthesize it, colorize it, give it wonderful tempos you know, just put a lot of kind of vibrancy in them. And 
so you would see a tape that would come out and be displayed unto itself like global groove, but then you would find in the installations that aspects of it were being recycled over and over and over again through, through the robots and through installations. So he was very clever about this idea of, in a certain way, constructing a limited set of images, but then getting maximum use out of them. Here's an image, a, a typical image. This is a, a frame grab from Global Groove. Okay, now the one place that gets kind of, there are two places that get kind of fuzzy with him. He begins his career with, uh, with uh, performance, but then he basically starts to abandon that. Uh, he performs a bit with uh, Charlotte Mormon and occasionally will still do, uh, into the early 70s, will do um, uh, musical performances. But basically he's deflected everything onto Charlotte. So he develops TV cello for her and TV bra and TV bed and he, you know, helps her stage things. But he kind of abandons that. But uh, it, it, doing things like this. But oddly enough, we have... A lot of his peers, like Bruce Nauman or Vito Acconci, they're all starting to put their bodies in front of the camera. And this seems to be an aspect that he overlooks and never uh, is worried by. Now, the other thing he does is even though there's something of a political undertone to his work, he's never very overt about it. And at the same time that he is doing his kind of glorious global groove type um, spectacles, we have things like this going on, you know, Media Burn, and we have groups like TV TV uh, covering uh, the Republican and the Democratic conventions and doing these kind of, you know, uh, clearly political works. So there's the whole video guerrilla world going on, which he uh, never, never really uh, has much truck with. Uh, let me see if I can, okay, so then here are just some of the basic things that um, uh, disrupt, disrupt the, uh, the museum. Uh, audio, which was nicely talked about before, but there's much more to say about it in the way that it intrudes on the aesthetic experience of the museum. Um, the uh, the confusion about um, formats and migration, which uh, you know we can talk about at some other time, and how purchasing installation becomes very ambiguous because it's uh, unclear truly what you're buying. Uh, and again, the, what I was talking about earlier, the kind of Neolithic infrastructure of the museums uh, in the 60s and the 70s and through the 80s, where they simply don't have the know-how to uh, do much about it. Um, where in the 90s, uh, one of the important things that happens is, well, there, there are several. One is the consumption of images increases to the level in which uh, it starts to insinuate itself into everybody's work. The idea of being a video artist is kind of, uh, there's a subtraction that happens and they take video away from that and you're called an artist. Uh, and, and at some level, even painters are now feeling obliged to have video somehow sitting within proximity. So there's this, the, the uh, kind of institutionalizing of the idea of having moving images. And finally, we have um, people who start buying this stuff. In the mid-90s, San Francisco did a very crazy thing. They birthed the Kramlicks. Uh, and uh, Dick was a, a venture capitalist and his wife loved kind of modern uh, aesthetic objects. And so they began to seriously buy video installations in the mid-90s. This was really, you know, people had been buying a Viola here and a Gary Hill there. But these people went in and wholesale bought millions of dollars worth of it. And it kind of set the stage and legitimized the idea. And... Uh, you know, I remember having a meeting with them just before they started doing this, and their big question is, does this stuff appreciate? I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our final panelist is um, Alan D'Souza, uh, whose conceptual photography, text mix, 
media installation, digital painting, text and performance works are derived partly from ethnographic methodologies of documentary and evidence, as well as counter strategies of fiction, erasure, reinscription, mistranslation, and subtle explorations of cultural transition. Uh, uh, D'Souza has exhibited extensively in the United States and internationally, including recently at San Francisco Camera Work, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the Fowler Museum in Los Angeles, the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., the Walther Collection, Germany, Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Guangzhou Biennale in Korea. Uh, and uh, Alan is uh, Associate Professor and Chair of the New Genres Department at the San Francisco Art Institute. So, welcome, Alan. Um, thank you. Um, one, one of the things about uh, media, working with media, is, is that there's always the possibility of failure. Um, and so I'm going to see. Um, and uh, I guess another difficulty about being the last um, panelist um, of the day is that everyone's very sleepy, and uh, I always want to respond to um, what other people have been saying that sounded much more interesting than what I was going to talk about. So actually... Um, Jeffrey, can I ask you to do something for me, please? Just in the interest of saving time, I'm going to um, just type in something, and I'm going to ask Jeffrey to read my first paragraph. Um, and it is. I'm going to type in there. This is this is really not a performance. It's just to save time. Um, uh, actually, maybe if you just read that, and you can't read my handwriting, so I'll read my handwriting, and then you can go back to the rest. But just the first paragraph. I should just read that continuously. Okay, my voice is not as beautiful as Alan's, unfortunately. Just, I was born in Kenya when it was a British colony. Okay. Um, and uh, what I had uh, written in was, my birthday was also the same date that videotape was made available. And if you were paying attention to Steve, you'll remember what year that was. Okay. Sorry, you can continue. Both sides of my family traced themselves to Goa when it was a Portuguese colony, but it is now India. I grew up in England, whose nationality I have. I have lived in the U.S. for 20 years. I was named after an American actor. By coincidence, my middle name is shared with the city in which I now live, and my last name is Portuguese. While I insist on my claim to each one of these locations and nomenclatures, these claims are political ones, and to paraphrase Mary Kelly, I can insist on these claims because I understand them as forms of interrogation. To clarify, I insist on my right to any and all of these designations to call into question each, what each one means and especially how each is changed in relation to another. I provide this biographical information here because it is something the museum insists upon. Shall um, I continue? Okay, no, that's it. Thank, um, uh, thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, it might have been more convincing actually coming from him. Um, so, um, uh, this is another location. Uh, and also because um, uh, I was thinking of uh, what Malik. Uh, Gaines this morning said, uh, as an artist, one never knows what one is expected to talk about. You, you up here to talk about your own work. Um, is it the opportunity to explore other ideas, the, the opportunity to do things that you wouldn't necessarily do in an artist talk? Um, and so I might not get to, to talk sufficiently about my work, so if you're interested, you can just go there. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, let's see where Jeffrey got up to. Uh, I'm going to just repeat, I think, what his last line was. I provide this biographical information here because it is something that the museum insists upon. Though the museum would prefer a degree of simplicity. While I understand one of the roles of the museum is that of an archive where things are put in their place, in both senses of that phrase, 
Locating an artist by place and date of birth or by citizenship is not only contradictory to how many artists situate themselves, but contradictory to their artistic practices. How do museums and curators respond to this increasingly common contemporary situation of shifting demographics and multiple migrations, whereby places of origin are no longer defining formations of art practices? And is it possible for this response to examine the continuing importance of place and cultural location as themselves the subjects and inquiry of artwork without reading them only as causally linked? How does the museum situate an art practice that resists being read through paradigms of, for example, Africanness, yet one that still frames itself through a cultural politics derived from the colonization of Africa? What are the appropriate framing mechanisms for contemporary art that it locates itself through discourse rather than through, through geographic, cultural, or discipline specificity? My work is not publicly collected, partly because I imagine that I do not represent a public. Uh, I and my work don't fit within the public archive as it currently stands. The work is not African enough, South Asian enough, Asian American enough, and certainly never American enough. I don't represent any given demographic, except the demographic of those that don't know which fork to use, to paraphrase earlier, that literally they don't fit. It's not clear where, where my work would go. It's not obviously photographic, but too photographic or too photo-based to fit elsewhere. It's not sufficiently Indian, or rather it doesn't look sufficiently Indian or African for those institutions that have such collections. And it's too Indian or too African, at least in terms of its situating discourses, for those institutions that have only contemporary collections. At the risk of wanting to have my cake and eat it, it's important that I'm an artist from Africa or India or Britain or America, and equally important that I'm an artist not located through space, and sorry, not located through place. And for better or worse, I expect the museum to address all those possibilities. The larger political project performed by so-called identity politics is not the construction and affirmation of marginalized or minoritarian subjectivities. These are strategies towards the larger project. It's not a project of wanting to belong, but of destabilizing and perhaps dismantling of majoritarian, dominant, and dominating subjectivities. And I realize there's an equivalent debate around gay marriage. I was recently considering Sunil Gupta's photographs see, at Yerba Buena's recent exhibition of contemporary Indian art, The Matter Within. And uh, the uh, curator of that show, Betty Sue, was here a second ago. I think she went out to get a phone call. Okay. Okay, okay Betty Sue's back there. Uh, the curator of The Matter Within. Um, and I realized that while Gupta's work is necessarily seen within a discourse of Indian art, it also gains clarity in relation to Isaac Julian, for whom Gupta was a set photographer, including on films such as Looking for Langston. Gupta's photographs look like Julian's films, and vice versa. Most likely, it's through Gupta's iconic photographs, such as these, that we remember looking for Langston. In other words, we remember the film through the photograph, and the film of one author by the photograph of another. We therefore have to locate, also locate Gupta through the aesthetics, aesthetics and politics of black British art, and the particular queer strands within it, which lead us, for example, not only to Stuart Hall, but also to Derek Jarman. And here, almost as evidence of that connection um, from Gupta's pretended family relationship series from 1988, we see uh, Isaac Julian in the middle. And on the right is me, uh, on the far right. This kind of multiple mapping is the only way to track artistic practices, yet is rarely pursued by the museum. 
There are attempts to track influence, but these tend to be a one-on-one -on -one relationship and unidirectional. For example, the, the New York Guggenheims, The Third Mind, American Artists Contemplate Asia, um, which is elsewhere known as The Blurred Mind, American Artists Contemplate Their Navels. <laughs> Although there, there is a move towards acknowledging hybridity and intranationalism, national normativities, if I can use that term, remain intact. One criticism, more a complaint, I heard about the Yerba Buena show, actually from a critic, was that the works didn't look Indian, or at least what the critic imagined how Indian, Indian art should look. And, she continued, layering, layering offense upon ignorance, they look like copies of Western art. This, unfortunately, is a still common perception. The implication, of course, is that an artist such as myself is too tainted by the West. Imagine this absurdity. I don't know, it just doesn't look American. <laughs> On the other hand, this does look American. And while not, not exactly universal, it is at least globalized as capitalist realism. Back to Yerba Buena. While the matter within was downstairs, I had a simultaneous solo show upstairs. The timing and placement were appropriate um, and carefully planned by Betty Sue and uh, the other curator, Julio Morales. Um, my work was linked to perpetual takeoffs, transitions, and landings, linked to foreign bodies and figments of the imagination. So that's uh, an insulation shot, and again,
California, here we come. So I don't know if it's American art, but it's about becoming American art. Um, so there's there's a way that uh, this is one clip of a, a whole series of landings and of takeoffs. Um, and as you see, that there actually isn't an actual arrival. Um, you s still see the shadow of the plane as if it never actually touches ground. Um, and it's the same with the takeoffs that one never actually leaves. Um, and so the work in some ways is about a kind of transition um, or per perpetual arrival and a perpetual leaving. Um, and the photographs uh, that were in the show um, use the same um, uh, technique of mirror imaging. Uh, so with the planes, I'm shooting out the side of the window and then mirror image, Im that image with itself to reflect itself. Um, and that's what's happening with these photographs which are taken from the plane um, during flight uh, of the landscape bef below. Um, and I wanted these to look as though they were some kind of mimicry of Indian art um, or sort of Indian shrines and Indian gods and goddesses. Um, so there's a kind of mimicry of, of people's expectations of contemporary Indian art but these are the California landscape. Um, okay. Um, so I'm gonna go through um, a few pieces and until Jeffrey tells me to stop. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, actually, let me come back to this. So um, this new, new media and time-based work, whatever we want to call it, um, offer an opportunity not to create another category or another department or another discipline, but to rethink and infiltrate other more established medium-based departments and work across disciplines. I work primarily with the photograph, and I say the photograph, since my engagement is with what a photograph is and what a photograph does. More so, I'm interested in the cross-fertilization between disciplines and the mongrelization that destabilizes categories of purity. I also want to make a case for phot photography being time-based and multidisciplinary. Photography is historically, aesthetically, and conceptually linked to painting. It inherits a lot of its language from painting. And Roland Barth, the genial granduncle of photo theory, also links it to theater since we pose or are posed. The photograph itself is also a performance or the resulting artifact from a whole sequence of performative acts. And I want to distinguish performative from performance. So through that repeated action of multiple posings, we perform and produce our identities and perform and reproduce them repeatedly. The photographic representations, these posing of, of our identities, enact that reiterative power to produce and reproduce us. This is one of the actions through which photography becomes a political form, and one of the reasons why I'm so invested in it. We also need to consider photography's links to writing, to the news story, for example, uh, which is one of our primary encounters with the photograph. And, and more specifically, what I'm interested in, photography's relationship to the novel. We continue to be invested in the truth-telling, or rather the evidentiary claims of photography, despite more than 150 years of evidence to the contrary, that the camera is a device for producing convincing fictions. Roland Barth again, differentiates photography from, photography from language by the former's irrefutable evidence of that has been the thing that posed even momentarily before the lens. Um, and that's what Re Rebecca this morning referred to, um, Bath's reference to linking of photography to death. It's, it's something that's taken place uh, in front of the camera, and therefore when we see the photograph, it's something that has already passed and is always in the past. Um, Okay, so uh, the thing that is posed even momentarily before the lens, while language is by nature fictional in that it does not provide evidence of its own veracity, despite our legal contortions of signatories and oaths. 
the objectivity, in quotes, that we as viewers have learned to attribute to photography, and, and I emphasize it as, as a learning process, um, that we learn to attribute a veracity to photography, is an aesthetic and ideological construction of universalism that privileges certain experiences over others and certain experiencing bodies over others and that ideologically locates the photographer and viewer in hierarchical relationships to what is being photographed. If the photographer is godlike, what kinds of epistles are the resulting photographs and what kind of worshippers are we as viewers? The current ubiqu ubiquity of cameras, including on cell phones, means that either we all attain the, the status of quasi-divinity, or the godlikes are demoted to the status of, ordin of ordinariness. And this poses a problem for the art marketing of photographers. What does the artist photographer do that the citizen photographer does not? Um, and uh, the art market's uh, answer to that was to make bigger prints. And that's, that seemed for a while the only defining uh, ca characteristic of art photography. I don't think it's only perversity in my part that causes me to switch their functions so that language provides evidence and photography is fictional. And let me clarify that. I want photography to be fictive, not something made up, but a form of imagining, what Ranciere describes as a different sensing of reality, one that is not yet held in common or that works against the common sense of previous knowledge, or an imagining that works against a ready-made public. Unlike viewing a sequence of photographs where you have control over time, as viewers, you can allocate your own time to each image. You can rewind, as it were, walk back and forth, create your own narrative sequence, assess new information through prior information, and vice versa. And that's one reason why I work with photography. It becomes a time-based medium when experienced by the viewer, since you, as viewers, have control over your time engagement. As a writer-photographer, I tend to be drawn towards the discomforting proximity of close quarters, of intimacy, where the body is compromised, and where the photographing body, like mine, is racially marked, it is compromised by having been already profiled. And the action of using a camera in public enhances that profiling. I don't aspire to that universalist objectivity, nor am I, uh, am I allowed that luxury. When questioned by fellow passengers on a plane about the photographs I'm taking, I can't claim to be just a photographer. I myself are being constructed through the act of taking photographs, as well as through the photographs themselves. Taking photographs is learnt behaviour. It's an almost mythic performance weighted by its history, a staging confluence, confluence of all those imaginaries, both performative and performance. And the photograph, the evidence of that restaging. Even the snapshot, the hastily taken photograph, is learnt behaviour. One method of countering such histories and practices is within the shifting territories or slippage between language and disciplinary systems not necessarily of convincing fiction, but of critical fiction. I want to push against the boundaries of what constitutes a photograph, since, to put it as bluntly as I can, either I don't see myself in the histories for which photography provides evidence, or where I might see myself, and I emphasize this contingency, I don't like what I see. Thank you. Well, this unwieldy panel somewhere between George Kuchar and Namjoon Pike, we've run out of time. And, uh, but uh, Alan will be speaking with uh, uh, Julia Bryan Wilson uh, tomorrow afternoon, and the other panelists will be around. So hopefully <clears throat> this range of uh, issues and questions uh, uh, can uh, reemerge in other discussions and informally as well. So thank you all for coming and staying. <laughs>